Amen. Have you ever been on a long journey? Maybe it was a trip to another country. Maybe it was a hiking trip that you took with some friends that covered many miles. Or maybe it wasn't the literal kind of journey, but a metaphorical one, a spiritual journey. Maybe it led you to many different churches from childhood until now. But we go on a lot of different journeys throughout our lives. Some of them are big journeys and some small. But there are two commonalities in all of these journeys that are always present and are key to their success. The first is the need for a guide. Now, the guide might be a person or it could be an object like a map. Now, you might have even taken it upon yourself for some of these trips to make yourself the guide by teaching yourself things and becoming familiar with where you're going. But the fact remains that whether it's an object or a person, when we go on a journey, we need a guide of some kind. The second commonality is, and it may seem obvious, but it really is crucial, a destination. We never set on a journey without at least an intended destination, because otherwise, why go? And when will it end? The destination is the place we want to end up. In the case of a trip that you're going to travel to another country or hiking, you typically know the place you want to go. And the success or failure of your journey depends on whether or not you actually get there. But for the more metaphorical journeys involving relationships or spiritual growth, we don't always know exactly what the destination is. We know what we're looking for, so our destination in that sense is also metaphorical. But you don't know exactly when or how those things might happen. For example, you may know that you want to get married, but you don't know who that's going to be and when it's going to occur, or that you want to find the truth of God, but you're not sure when that's going to happen exactly and how it is that you're going to get there. Without a guide or a destination, the journey will not go well, not only because of these two things are essential in and of themselves, but because they drive pretty much every other aspect of preparation and travel for a journey. For example, in 2006, during my junior year of high school, my Boy Scout troop went to Philmont Boy Scout Ranch in New Mexico, and we plotted to do a 110-mile hiking trip in 12 days while carrying everything that we brought with us in backpacks on our backs. And I was chosen to be the crew leader. Now, the crew leader is responsible, along with the help of the adult advisor for the crew, for being the guide for the journey. I had to do research, get to know the itinerary and the travel that we were going to have, the camps we were going to visit, and then I made a map that our group was going to use throughout the trip. Where we would go, when we would leave those places, who would be leading our group and navigating each day, what time we wanted to get to certain places, and where we were going to get our food and our water throughout the trip. As the guide, I was responsible for making these decisions, and most of those decisions were made while keeping the destination in mind. How many miles were going to be covered each day was affected by how far we needed to go and where we needed to end up at the end of each day. Now, this is a lot of responsibility for a high schooler, so Philmont knows that, and they send out an even more competent guide called a ranger for the first couple of days of your trip. And the ranger is somebody who knows the land so well that they can just kind of go off on their own in the backcountry and nobody really worries about them. Now, he helps us navigate the first couple of days so that we don't get lost and equips us with the knowledge we need in order to do well on our trip. He helps us set up camp. He teaches us how to hang our bear bags and what we needed to put in those so we didn't have quite a surprise when we woke up. And he helps us navigate from place to place. Because the staff also knows that these two things are important, a guide and a destination. It's so important, in fact, that they keep track of your itineraries. And if your group does not show up where they're supposed to be, and it's been a little while, they send out a search party because something has gone wrong. You've gotten lost. There have been stories of crews and troops that were tracked by uh, mountain lions or bears and things like that. 
So last week we discussed that in Lent we're on a journey. And Lent can be a miserable journey if we lose sight of our guide or lose our way. And this can happen when we realize we, we don't realize who our guide actually is and what our destination is. So who is our guide? And how do we know that our guide is worth following? Now, you might think the answer to that first question is obvious, the Sunday school answer. Our guide is Jesus, and you would be correct. But last week and this week, Jesus is saying and doing things that make people doubt that He knows what He's doing and where He's going. Last week, Jesus explained to His disciples for the first time what it really meant to be the Christ, and their response was such a visceral rejection that Peter, who just described Jesus as the Christ, took Him aside and rebuked Him. And then Jesus taught about all the, the denying of yourself and bearing your cross, that following Him is a different sort of thing entirely. And this week, Jesus comes into the temple during Passover and finds merchants and money changers in the temple peddling their goods. And He drives them out of the temple with a whip of cords and overturns their tables. Now, this is a famous account of Jesus because as I asked the kids, when you picture Jesus, you don't usually picture this image in your mind. And because we've heard this account so often, it's been somewhat normal. The frequency of hearing this story and our familiarity with the account, it still seems strange to us, and we feel the need to explain Jesus' actions because they don't fit our picture. So if we're going to use our guide language, if I'm just looking at what Jesus is doing, I'm not so sure he knows what he's doing or where he's going. Now, it gets even more abnormal when we dig into the, the context of our gospel reading. The things being sold were the animals needed for the sacrifices of Passover in the temple. So it wasn't that they were just sort of setting up shop in the temple for no reason. There were people coming from far distances, and it wasn't really practical for all of them to bring their animals, and so they can come and purchase the animal needed for the sacrifice at the temple. And it's the same with the money. The money that would be in accordance with Levitical law were Jewish shekels that had no image on them, and so people would need to come and exchange their money in order to be in accordance with Levitical law. So this even more begs the question, why does Jesus do what He does? Why does He disrupt the sale of sacrifices and the exchange of money? Because it seems like it's all being done in service to what the temple is for making the offerings and sacrifices due to God? Well, that's precisely the question he gets asked by the Jews after he comes in in a fury and overturns tables and drives people out. They say to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? In other words, by what authority, what right do you have to do what you just did? Or if we're going to use the language of our guide, how do we know this is the right way to go? Now, Jesus, of course, as He does often, answers the question in a puzzling way. His answer to their question of, what sign do you show us for doing these things, is, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now, if you just, like, throw everything out that you know about the Bible and you're just reading that exchange, it's weird. That's a strange response to the question. And the Jews at this point are probably at best confused and at worst likely starting to think that Jesus is a little cuckoo. Three days? They say it took 46 years to build this temple and you're going to rebuild it in three days? What do you think if somebody said that to you? I would probably think they're crazy too. But it turns out that that's not really what Jesus is talking about that they can't see what Jesus is referring to, nor can they understand the words that He says, and they're not alone. Because as was the case last week, is so this week that Jesus is a guide for something new, a completely new journey to God. I don't think that we can fully appreciate or understand the importance of the temple in Jerusalem before Christ comes along. This was the destination for all of God's people's journeys to God. 
It's a destination that oriented them all. When you prayed, you turned toward the temple for your daily prayers. When sacrifices were to be made to God, you made long journeys and pilgrimages to Jerusalem in order to do them, as is the case with our gospel reading today. The temple was the destination for God's people. And that's because, as I shared with the kids, it was His house where He promised to dwell among His people. So if you wanted relationship and communion with God, you went to the temple. Now, in the Old Testament, the centrality, purity, and observance of all God's commands regarding the temple were what accounted for the rise and fall of God's people. They were the measure of their faithfulness to the covenant that God had made with them. When Israel or her kings corrupted the temple with false idols and false teachings, He gave them over to their enemies, and things didn't go so well. But when Israel or her kings kept faithful and pure the temple of God, God blessed them and prospered them. Now enter Jesus into this temple on a holy day where the people of God have come to observe the sacrifice of the Passover as God Himself commanded them to do, and Jesus drives away some of the mechanism of sacrifice from the temple. Why would He do that? What authority does He have to do that? And so the Jews ask Him that. And the response that Jesus has ultimately to that question is that He Himself is the temple of God. In verse 21 it says, But He was speaking about the temple of His body. So it turns out for our journey in Lent that Jesus is not only the guide, but He's also the destination. Jesus' response makes no appeal to any other authority besides His own. When I was serving as a guide, I could not do that. I had to appeal to the authority of the map and all of the research that had gone into knowing where I was going. Jesus doesn't need to do that. He knows the lay of the land better than anyone else. He's the only one that can truly see what's going on in the world. From the beginning of the account of the cleansing of the temple, Jesus operates as if He has every right and authority in and of Himself to cleanse the temple. Now, this isn't as abnormal as it sounds. In the Old Testament, the righteous kings like David, Solomon, and Hezekiah, they did the same. By what authority? They were the king. Well, Jesus is the king. He's not yet recognized here in this text. Even His disciples don't know who He really is yet. Their recognition comes later. But Jesus hasn't come now to simply purify the temple from false gods and idols, but to fulfill its purpose completely and fully in Himself, to become the temple, the dwelling place of God for His people in its place. Jesus isn't just our guide on this new path to God. He is our destination. Now, for all those who seek to pray and worship in spirit and truth, as He told the lady at the well, it's not going to just happen in Jerusalem any longer. Now, our orienting destination is Jesus. We no longer turn to a building in the city of Jerusalem, but to our Lord and Savior. You can even see it a bit in the way that the architecture of our worship space is designed. What is at the center? Where Christ is present among us. So instead, we turn to Jesus because He's now the new temple of God. Well, you know how you sometimes wonder when you read an account in the Scriptures, how would I have responded if I was there listening to what Jesus is saying and watching what He's doing? And I think we often like to think, I'd get it. Well, the text answers that question for you today. You wouldn't. You would be just as confused as everyone else, including the disciples. And it makes it clear in verse 22 why that is. When therefore He was raised from the dead, His disciples remembered that He had said this, and they believed the Scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. In other words... They didn't understand until they had reached the destination of their journey, and then they remembered and understood. Now, how did they remember? Well, later in the book of John, in chapter 14, he tells us how this works. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, 
But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And so it is for us too. How do we know that Jesus, despite what we can't see, is a faithful and true guide? Because as we journey in the season of Lent, by the grace and gift of the Holy Spirit, we know the destination. We know the destination isn't a dead Jesus on Good Friday. We know the destination is an ever-living, victorious, resurrected Jesus on Easter. That He is, in fact, now the temple of God. So by the power of the Holy Spirit today, as we hear these words and receive them, we remember and believe them because Jesus is who He said He was that He's speaking about His victory over death in the grave, about His fulfillment of the atonement, all the cost that needs to be paid has been paid by Him and for us no more is needed. And so we ask, what sign do you show us for doing these things? His answer, the destination, a resurrection from death to an eternal, unbreakable life ought to do the trick. For that is our Lenten and our life's journey. That's its destination. And it turns out we have a really good guide. In the name of Jesus, amen.